Hello and welcome back to my 10th F1 chat. My name is Alex does F1 stuff and we have hit the big milestone that is episode number 10. And in today's episode we have three topics to discuss and the first being that Sir Sterling Moss has unfortunately died. This was not due to coronavirus. Renault might be pursuing Racing Point in a legal challenge about their car or, you know, Tracing Point, the pink Mercedes, the RPW10, whatever you want to call it. And then finally, there's an alternate history. Who knows? So without further ado, we will jump straight on into the first article, which comes from the Formula One website. And it is sadly that the F1 legend Sir Sterling Moss has died at age 90. So Sterling Moss was one of the true greats of Formula One, uh, often referred to as the greatest driver to never win the world championship. He contested in 66 Grand Prix from 1951 to 1961, driving for the likes of Van Wall, Maserati and Mercedes, where he famously formed a contented and ruthlessly effective partnership with the lead driver Juan Manuel Fangio, who as you do know is a five-time world champion. In his 10-year career, Moss took 16 wins, some of which rank among the truly iconic drives in the sports uh, history. His 1961 victories in Monaco and Germany in particular often held up as the all-time classics. So Moss was also a highly regarded sports car driver, famously winning the 1955 Mille Miglia on public roads for Mercedes at an average speed of close to 100 miles an hour, while he also competed in rallies and land speed attempts. So it is very unfortunate news that we have lost one of the greatest British drivers that has raced in Formula One. He was, of course, the first British driver to win the British Grand Prix in, I believe, 1955. And then in 57, he was the first British driver to win the British Grand Prix in a British car. And I just sort of have some uh, memories. In 2015, um, Lewis Hamilton did that awesome awesome side-by-side -side drive with him in the old 50s uh, Mercedes cars around the old banking of Monza. Um, they did release it again uh, on their social medias, so I do strongly recommend that you guys go and watch that. It was such an awesome video. So moving on from this tragic news, we move straight on into our second article, and oh my god, I'm including some speculative journalism. It's been a sort of dry week for uh, F1 News, so I thought, why not? Let's let's put in some speculation. This does come from Autosport, and my biggest issue with them is that their headline is not on two lines, so the first paragraph looks a bit like this. It's just a bit rubbish. Anyway, it says that F1 uh, Renault F1 bosses Cyril Abitable says his team is still uneasy about Racing Point's pink Mercedes, with a formal challenge on its legality still not out of the question. So Racing Point caused a stir in preseason testing when it revealed it an RP20 design that was based on last year's title-winning Mercedes W10. With the Silverstone-based outfits was adamant uh, that it had done nothing outside of the regulations, some rivals were not happy about such a clone being allowed. See, the thing with this is, yes, they they they, uh, they did essentially clone the car. They have done that. But my biggest question is to them, do they fully understand the design philosophy? Because you can't just take one car and then say yes this is perfect this is going to work all the year round because yes it will however every other team is going to update their car because they truly understand their design philosophy as it is their own if racing point don't fully understand it then they're not necessarily going to be able to add updates to it just again a bit more speculation so moving further into the article, uh, speculation in the build-up of the season opening Australian Grand Prix suggested that Renault was considering lodging an official protest over the matter to get a definitive ruling on what teams were and were not allowed to copy. Personally, it's just a bit of a it's a bit of a sly move from Renault, I think, because yes, Renault haven't copied anyone or they they've designed their own car and such, but it was last year's car, so it shouldn't really work too well. Yes, it's a proven design, it was a title-winning design, but for the previous year. So it's not going to be winning races, it's not going to be 
competing for podiums often. Yes, it will probably be the top of the midfield, but if Renault were so upset, surely they could do the same. It was kind of similar to uh, Braun 2009 when they brought out their double diffuser. Everyone, Red Bull especially, uh, Red Bull are uh, kings at doing this, but they complained to hell because they didn't design it. And then the moment that it was declared legal, bang, they whacked it straight on their car, copying Braun. Obviously, that's a specific part. And no, it wasn't just Braun that developed the double diffuser. I think Toyota and Williams did as well. I, I can see where they're coming from, because to copy an entire car or a good portion of it is a little bit sneaky, but perfectly legal, in my opinion. So, chucking ourselves further into the article, although the matter of legality has been put on hold for several months, uh, obviously due to coronavirus, Abitable has told French television that the matter is still a concern to his team, and uh, as he likened what Racing Point had done to an artist copying another's painting to sell it on. So they've got great photographers, that's for sure, but to be fair, I have noticed how they have quite honestly said they copied. I think it's the first time since I joined Formula One that someone has re has been really proud of copying another team. Uh, yeah, yeah, you can see where he's coming from there. And again, in all the pre-season tests for uh, Force India, Racing Point were very, very happy with the progress their car was making and were a bit gutted that they couldn't race straight away to prove what they could do. Obviously, it's not quite like the copying scandal of... Ferrari McLaren in 2007, I think, yeah, 2007, where, where McLaren had all the design blueprints of the Ferrari and were completely copying exactly their car. Racing Point have done this slightly differently by just taking lots and lots of photos. It also doesn't help that, or it may help Racing Point, doesn't help the... No, scrap that. So it would also help that Racing Point are using the Mercedes wind tunnel in Brackley. Um, they're sort of sharing it. So they have the same sort of engineers that develop the car. Obviously, you've got your Racing Point engineers and your Mercedes engineers separate, but it's still in the same wind tunnel. And like with the Ferrari and the Haas things, um, something that sort of came out in, in that uh, debacle was that Ferrari would just leave a bit on the desk for when the rep for when the Haas team came in and Haas went hmm, yes we'll, we'll we'll do that or Ferrari wanted something to test but they didn't want to put it on their car because they didn't know if it would work we'll leave it out for Haas to pop on now that is just utter utter speculation and I don't really like it um or I don't really like discussing it and, and putting it into a video that people might just believe obviously I will happily have a chat with people around and people with F1 knowledge about it, just saying this could be a thing that happens, but to openly broadcast it and say this is what it is and to write an article saying yada yada yada, points, 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 it, it just, it's too speculative, I don't really like it. So we will move straight to our final article. Oh, I didn't have a transition. Ew, that was yucky. Anyway, well, there you go. Didn't have a transition. Um, alternative histories. What if Hamilton hadn't joined Mercedes? So I quite liked this. Um, it was a feature article. It was quite a long one, but I will read probably all of it. So sport as a whole is full of what if moments and Formula One is no different. What if a driver hadn't made that split second decision behind the steering wheel? What if a team boss hadn't gone against his instincts and signed that driver? As F1 celebrates its 70th anniversary, we're taking a look back at the moments and decisions that had huge ramifications for the sport and for those who participate. Starting with a sliding doors moment for Lewis Hamilton. It began with two laboured press conferences at Suzuka on October 4th, 2012. In the first, Michael Schumacher explained, for the second time in his career, why he was retiring. This was the courtesy part of Lewis Hamilton's shock decision to uh, switch from McLaren to replace him at Mercedes, the Silver Arrows letting Michael have his say first. 
Then Lewis deadpanned his way through a torturous press conference in which he as studiously avoided making further comment on his forthcoming move. Now, I remember when this uh, came out. Um, I wasn't very old at the time, but I do roughly remember. It It did kind of shake up the the system a bit because you, you, you take Hamilton from a race-winning team, a team that gave him his world championship, almost two of them, but he was still in a race-winning team and moving to a team that had only scored one podium and one victory. At, was it one podium? No, just one victory in 2012 at this point with Nico Rosberg at China. They had scored a handful of podiums, I don't remember the exact number. So moving from a proven race-winning team to one that has only got one, victory seemed a little bit rushed. And as I think Martin Whitmarsh said, he's never going to win anything ever again. And now look. So in Paddock and in print, there was no shortage of sage journalists prepared to commit to their belief that in leaving McLaren for Mercedes, the 2008 World Championship World Champion was committing career suicide. Of course, with that greatest of all wisdoms, hindsight, we can look back and laugh. After all, five World Championships and another 63 victories are tungsten, solid proof that he was right to yield to Nicky Lauda's blandishments to stick are to up sticks and join the team that went on to dominate the era of the turbo hybrid F1 car. But if it weren't for an engine failure in Malaysia 2016, Lewis would have won all six titles. Mercedes wanted to keep Lewis, of that there is no doubt. Chairman Ron Dennis even famously said, if things pan out the way I expect them to, I'm pretty sure he will be sat in a McLaren next year. And if you looked at what was happening at McLaren back in 2012 and compared that to what Mercedes had achieved since 2010, it surely seemed a slam dunk that Lewis would stay put. In that three-year period, McLaren won 18 races to Mercedes 1. But this wasn't a situation entirely about current performance or claims of future performance. Lewis wanted the personal freedom he needs to perform at his best. And the bold statistics that say that he was absolutely right to leave McLaren. So that's sort of the background as to what led up to the alternative reality. But what if Lewis had stayed at McLaren and not joined the Silver Arrows? What if he had continued to keep the faith, having first approached Ron Dennis when he was a 10-year-old kid um, doing pretty well in karting? Lauda had clearly decided that Michael was past his best, hence going after Lewis for Mercedes in the first place. And with three titles already won with Red Bull, would Sebastian Vettel have been bold, rash even, enough to gamble on walking away from such such success to join Mercedes in his hero's steed? Given the team's uh, poor performances up to 2012, it's much more likely that the pragmatic Nicky would have switched his sights to Fernando Alonso, who by the end of 2012 must have been um, despairing over Ferrari ever delivering him a world championship. At that stage, Fernando had bagged 30 victories, 9 more than Lewis had in his pre-Mercedes years, and 2 titles. Were he to have mirrored what Lewis subsequently achieved with Mercedes, 5 titles and 63 race victories, and who is to say that he might not have done better still, the Spaniard would now have 7 titles and 93 victories, and would be the statistical king of the castle. Now there's a thought. So Mercedes began to turn the tide in 2013, while McLaren fell over the cliff at exactly the same time. That season, Nico Rosberg won two races, Lewis won, the Briton starting from pole five times, and the German thrice. McLaren, by contrast, had a disastrous year and fell into the slump from which they are only just recovering. They haven't looked like winning again since 2012. Given that Jensen had scored eight of their 18 victories in the previous years, When paired with Lewis, it's fair to judge uh, that the pair were pretty evenly matched. That was a bit of a mouthful. Thus, the fact that Jensen's best score in 2013 was a paltry fourth place in Brazil is a damning indication of just how far the Woking team had fallen, and how much Lewis would have also struggled in the McLaren. Even though he could get more out of a bad car than Jensen could, he would have definitely not been in the title fight that year and it's not inconceivable that he would have been looking uh, for a move elsewhere by the end of it. But Mercedes' doors would have probably been closed. 
in our alternative reality, Alonso would have already been there, and would they have been risked dropping Nico to take Lewis after the aggro between the Spaniard and the rookie Brit at the McLaren in 2007? It's unlikely. So where else would he have gone? So let's assume that Seb would have had enough clout at Red Bull to keep the door shut there. That would only leave Ferrari uh, of the top tier teams with space left for Lewis. So what if Lewis had gone alongside Daniel Ricciardo for 2014? That would have opened up a whole new universe, because Seb would likely have had to stay at Red Bull and not gone to Ferrari for 2015, and may later have had to accept Max Verstappen as his teammate. Seb and Max, that pairing, and the inevitable fireworks would have made his moments with Charles Leclerc at Ferrari uh, last year look like squabbles in a nursery. No question, Ferrari would not have delivered Lewis uh, the string of titles and wins that followed at Mercedes in real life. Possibly they would have fallen to, to Nico, who might now uh, still be unretired. But with only one win in his career up to, that, up to that turning point at the end of 2012, he'd still be a long way off Schumacher's record 91 victories. And if he couldn't beat Lewis regularly and gave up under the strain after winning his championship in 2016, it's unlikely he would have done any better against Fernando. But might Lewis have turned 2018 and 19 into Ferrari titles if he was there? He doesn't tend to make the mistakes that Seb does, and both these cars were quick enough to be championship winners. If he had, it would have left Alonso with, say, five titles and hungry for more. Lewis with three, not six, and set up for a very different Mercedes v Ferrari fight in 2020. So that is a pretty cool look at an alternative history. I might look at doing something similar myself, uh, possibly, um, obviously with some tables because I love me some Excel tables, but I'm still working on a couple of my other projects as well. So yeah, I hope you have all enjoyed that video guys, and I will catch you whenever I make the next one. See you next time.